Thank you all for being here again today. Uh, we appreciate your presence at these press conferences. I'd like to introduce our speaker list. We'll have Sheriff Bill Brown, United States Coast Guard Captain Monica Rochester, Santa Barbara County Fire Chief Mark Hartwig, ATF Special Agent in Charge Carlos Canino, and Suzanne Grimacy from our county's Behavioral Wellness. We also Getting things going here, you'll hear from Sheriff Brown in a moment, but here's where everything stands right now. Investigators have recovered, as we know, 33 bodies from the wreckage of the boat. One victim is still missing. Yesterday, the NTSB held their final press conference to talk about the crew's experience during the fire. Let's turn things over now to investigators out at the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office. Ladies and gentlemen of the press for being here today. We have an update for you, and I want to preface these remarks as I did uh, the last press briefing. Uh, by recognizing that much of the information that we're about to disclose and to discuss is going to be painful and difficult for the family members of those who were lost in this terrible tragedy. And we want you to know that you're still in our hearts. Our condolences go out to you. And as painful and difficult as this is, we hope that you will find some measure of comfort in some of the information that we have for you today. The search and recovery operation uh, is continuing and we have had an incredible response to our mutual aid request for assistance in this search and rescue uh, and subsequent search and recovery operation. Dive teams and marine units from across the state as well as our federal partners and state partners have assisted in this effort. They have brought resources as well as technical expertise to the scene. We are in our fifth day now of this incident, and today we will have divers from the Sheriff's Dive Team, the FBI, and the National Park Service in the water once again. Their top priority today is the recovery of the remaining victim that is still outstanding, as well as evidence recovery for the ongoing investigation of the cause and origin of this fire. Today, the salvage operation of the vessel, the uh, conception, is underway, and Captain Rochester will share more detail about that in a moment. As the vessel is moved during the operation, uh, our divers will search the area that has heretofore been inaccessible to them, as well as search, again, the vessel itself for the last victim. The ATF National Response Team has arrived and will be assisting as well. I'd like to thank uh, ATFE Los Angeles Special Agent in Charge Carlos Canino, who will speak uh, later in this news conference to share how his office and this special team will be assisting in this investigation. From the standpoint of the coroner's office, so far the sheriff's coroner's office has received a total of 33 of the 34 victims from the conception. Due to the intense fire that occurred on the vessel, all of the recovered remains have suffered varying degrees of fire damage, which requires DNA analysis to confirm the identities of the victims. For the past several days, the coroner's office and sheriff's investigators have worked diligently to both positively identify victims to obtain buccal swabs for uh, sample comparison purposes in the DNA process and to notify the next of kin. I want to share with you the process so that you have a better understanding of the monumental task that our investigators have been facing. When this incident began, our office was presented with a manifest, uh, a list of passengers who were on the vessel, names only with no other supporting documentation or details immediately available. As we were able to obtain more information through the Family Assistance Center, through the call center, and through other investigative means, we have been able to contact the family and loved ones of the passengers. As of this morning, I am happy to report that we have connected with family members for all 34 victims. The last family to be contacted was the mother of one of the victims who lives in Japan. As the DNA identification process requires, we have obtained buccal swab samples 
from families as a result of the assistance of the FBI field offices from throughout the United States and abroad. To give you an idea of the scope of this effort, the FBI connected with one family in Singapore and another family flew into Santa Barbara yesterday from India. We have been assisted by a host of allied local, state, and federal colleagues. Far too many for me to name individually at this press briefing. But I do want to give special thanks to Sacramento County Coroner Kimberly Jin, who immediately responded to our request for assistance with the ANDE, the A-N-D-E, Rapid DNA System, technology that her office uh, is trained in and used during the campfires uh, subsequent coroner's investigation. Her staff, as well as support from the Andy Corporation, who brought a second rapid DNA system to us from their offices in Colorado, has been invaluable in the process of rapidly identifying victims, allowing us to bring some measure of solace to some of the loved ones. The Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office has been a tremendous help with the coroner's investigative process as well, and I just want to give a special thanks to all of them and to all of our coroner staff and our divers who have been engaged in this terribly difficult process of recovering these victims and bringing them uh, to the coroner's bureau for examination and for ultimate release uh, to the family members. The coroner's office is charged with determining the cause and the manner of death. This process is ongoing and we will not be able to make those determinations final until toxicology results are in and the investigation into the cause and origin of the fire is complete. The Sheriff's Office will not be releasing the passenger manifest in whole out of respect for the families and in order to allow our investigators to make proper next of kin notifications. However, we do intend and will release the names of victims after we have positively identified them and have notified their next of kin of that positive identification. As of this press conference, we have been able, through the DNA process, to positively identify 18 of the victims. In nine of those cases, we have been able to contact and notify the next of kin of the victims. And those nine, I will release the names to you right now. Those victims are Raymond Scott Chan, aged 59, of Los Altos, California. Justin Carroll Dignam, 58, of Anaheim, California. Daniel Garcia, 46, of Berkeley, California. Mary Beth Guiney, 51, of Santa Monica, California. Yulia Krasinaya, 40, of Berkeley, California. Alexandra Kurtz, 26, of Santa Barbara, California. Caroline McLaughlin, 35, of Oakland, California. Ted Storm, Strom, 62, of Germantown, Tennessee and Wei Tan, 26, of Goleta, California. This list is representative of the diverse makeup of the passengers and crew who were aboard the Conception on that fateful day. They were from our local area and from throughout California, from across the United States and from around the world. Their tragic loss has devastated countless family members, loved ones, friends, and colleagues. We mourn their loss, and we want to assure those who they leave behind that we will continue working tenaciously to recover all of the victims, to determine how they died, and to investigate the cause of this terrible fire and loss of life with the hope that future such tragedies can be prevented. And now I'd like to bring up to the podium Captain Monica Rochester of the U.S. Coast Guard. Sheriff, 
I'm Captain Monica Rochester, Captain of the Port Coast Guard, Los Angeles, Long Beach. This past week, the Unified Command has visited with the families of the victims and have seen firsthand the impact that the tragedy has taken upon them. And our hearts and thoughts are continuing to be with them as they, they go through this terrible, terrible tragedy. Yesterday, the Unified Command, which consists of the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office, Santa Barbara City Fire, Santa Barbara County Fire, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, National Park Service, National Marine Sanctuary, came together to review a salvage and recovery plan of the motor vessel conception. This is an important step to this process, but I would like to be clear that the Coast Guard's role, the Coast Guard's role during this salvage and recovery operation is for the safety of those on scene during these recovery operations as well as the safety for the environment. Salvage operations can take some time. It, it is a very uh, exacting, tolling process on the folks that are on scene, uh, the divers that have to assist in, a, in the continued assessment and rigging of, of the vessel. So it, it's not a hurry up and lift and be placed on the barge. It's an incremental effort to make sure that we, we try our, our deliberative best to keep the vessel intact for further, uh, further investigation requirements. We will also continue to monitor the operation to provide uh, updates as necessary as, as they become um, rev uh, prevalent for us to, to do so. And at this time, I'd like to go ahead and transition over to um, Chief Hardwick for the Santa Barbara Fire. Thank you, Captain Rochester. Mark Hartwig, Fire Chief and Fire Warden for the County of Santa Barbara. We started this week by committing our resources and those of our partners throughout the state to rescue any potential survivors of this tragedy. We then continued to commit our resources to recovery and recovering the victims, uh, family members of this tragedy. And then I made the commitment to do any and everything we could to find the cause of the fire and the origin of the fire. I want to uh, first and foremost thank our partners to the south, uh, Ventura County Fire Department, who upon notification of the distress call uh, off the coast of Santa Barbara and Santa Cruz Island, responded immediately with multiple assets. As we commit to finding the cause of this fire and the origination point of this fire, I promise that we would leave no stone unturned we have uh, joining us in the investigation uh, formally now the what I would consider the A team for cause and origin, really uh, one of the best teams throughout the world, the national response team from the ATF. And I'm going to go ahead now and yield to uh, my colleague from the uh, uh, ATF. Good morning. My name is Carlos Canino. I'm the uh, Special Agent in Charge of the Los Angeles ATF Field Division. Um, before I say anything, um, I will not be taking any questions. I'll just be talking about the National Response Team and, and their capabilities. So, uh, And the reason for that is um, right now until they get on the scene and uh, we have more information, um, anything that I would say would be speculative. So I do not want to do that. So. Uh, First off, uh, on behalf of uh, ATF Director Regina Lombardo and the men and women of ATF, we'd like to express our condolences to all the victims and their families. Um, our hearts are with them and our thoughts and prayers are with them. Um, and we stand behind them. So as you might know, ATF is a federal agency with jurisdiction and expertise and resources to investigate large and complex fire scenes. Uh, ATF brings a unique expertise in the investigation of fire incidents, and we share this expertise with our, our federal, state, and local uh, 
partners as well as fire services. Um, ATF has been on scenes since, uh, since Monday um, in consultation with the Unified Command. Um, it was agreed upon that uh, the best course of action, or the next course of action, I should say, was to bring the, uh, the resources of ATS National Response Team. Um, they're arriving today. Some are already here. Um, they'll be arriving today and ready to go to work um, this evening. So our NRT will be uh, working alongside the men and women of the Unified Command, and our primary role is to determine the origin and cause of this fire. Uh, the NRT is comprised of senior ATF special agents, certified fire investigators, forensic mapping specialists, explosive, explosive enforcement officers, fire protection engineers, electrical engineers, forensic chemists, um, and other professionals. Um, when I was coming uh, on my way up here and I was talking to our bureau headquarters, um, I asked for a list of who, who was, which agents were going to be on the team, uh, and I was doing some quick math. Um, just for the agents alone, uh, there's over 250 years of experience in investigating fires. Um, so the team that's coming here to, to assist and try to get to the bottom of this uh, tragedy is, is exceptional. Uh, like I said, at this time, it's, it's too early to tell what the cause of the fire is. Um, and again, uh, it's imperative that uh, uh, I don't speculate or anybody else speculate and until, until we get a look um, at the boat. Um, and hopefully that'll be some time in the next few days. Uh, in complex investigations like this, where there's, where there's a large loss of life, uh, we take our time, process all the evidence, and uh, we don't put time limits on how long we're going to be here. We'll be here um, as, long, as long as we're needed. And, and again, the goal is to determine what the origin and cause of this, of this fire is. Um, I, like I, I spoke to our director, uh, and she... Uh, told me that all the resources of ATF uh, are available for this incident. So, thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Grimacy. I work with the County of Santa Barbara Department of Behavioral Wellness. We have together joined hands and hearts and made it through an incredibly difficult week. I feel both honored and humbled for the opportunity to have made connections with so many of the families who had loved ones aboard the Conception. I will cherish the stories which have been shared that describe family members hearing of their passions held for diving and for the underwater world. The Family Assistance Center closed on Wednesday evening. The center opened as a place to get information, resources, and counseling support, but it turned into so much more. It turned into a gathering spot for families to spend days together and share their stories with one another and gain support from one another. When we learned upon closing that new families would be coming to the area later Wednesday evening, the decision was made to open the doors hosted by Red Cross at their office site. On Thursday, with the same resources available, again, families joined together and were able to support the new arrivals to town. Today, families will again have the opportunity to join together and support one another throughout the day with mental health 
and spiritual support available as we await this evening's vigil. A vigil will be taking place tonight at 6.30 at Chase Palm Park. The vigil offers a time for community to come together to show support, to grieve, to receive the support of others, but above all, an opportunity for us together to honor the 34 lives which were lost on the conception. There are no words that can heal the pain that is being experienced by so many at this time. But we can be there for one another. I hope everyone that can will consider joining tonight's vigil at 630 at Chase Palm Park and beginning our journey together towards healing. Thank you. We're happy to take questions at this time, but just uh, in an effort to keep our questions clear and organized, please raise your hand, wait to be called on, and when you are, state your affiliation and your question and who the question is for specifically, and we'll bring that person to the podium to answer that for you. And I also just want to start by saying, as the sheriff mentioned, this is an ongoing investigation, and there are just some things that we're not at liberty to discuss uh, as far as the investigation itself, so please remember that when you're asking your questions. Probably two, two questions, one for the sheriff and one for Captain Rochester. So in response to your first question, uh, the investigations that are underway, and I, I emphasize investigations because there are multiple agencies investigating multiple aspects of what happened during this tragedy. Um, we are looking to determine what happened. And uh, a criminal element to that is always a possibility and is always something that we uh, would want to make sure that we have uh, evidence for and that we investigate. But uh, at this point, no one has been charged criminally, and we are proceeding uh, alongside our partners. And uh, the people who have been brought in have been brought in for a reason because of their specific expertise in, in specific areas. The NTSB with transportation related disasters, the ATF, because this uh, was, was fire, the ATF national team is probably the world's foremost in terms of investigating uh, fires. Uh, we want to make sure that we investigate every aspect um, of this. So it has not turned into a criminal investigation at this point. It is an investigation that is looking into all uh, related and associated elements to uh, the terrible tragedy. And then I'll let uh, Captain Rochester ask, answer the uh, question on salvage. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? Okay, so the question was, uh, winds are offering a challenge to this operation. Am I characterizing that correctly, sir? Uh, that is a, a, a big consideration. We, we are monitoring the weather patterns um, very deliberately. Uh, the forecast beginning later on this afternoon has winds increasing to about 35 knots, which puts uh, the salvage uh, in a precarious situation. They have thresholds um, that will go beyond um, the comfort of their safety level for the folks that are actually participating on site during the salvage operation. So what, if that comes to that, to where uh, the vessel has not been placed on board the barge at that point, I will make that determination that we will suspend, ensure that the vessel is appropriately anchored in consultation with the National Park Service, in consultation with the National Marine Sanctuary, and uh, put the, the barge and the uh, tug in a safe haven, and we'll wait for those winds to die down. Again, those are forecasted through the rest of the weekend, and hopefully that will subside and we'll be able to return the salvage operations um, and the equipment back on station sometime Monday. So it sounds unlikely you raised the boat. I, 
I don't have the definitive answer to that. It's again, this is a very deliberate process. It's not a fast process to raise that, so I, I don't have that information at this time. Yes, sir. The question, the question was the one remaining victim who has not yet been recovered. Have, have the remains been recovered or are they known to be somewhere and we haven't been able to get them? The, they have not been recovered at this point. We don't have uh, any uh, indication as to that person having been you know, seen or whatever like we had a few days ago where we couldn't get to certain victims. But with today's salvage operation, we're hoping that by uh, raising or partially raising the wreckage that our divers will be able to access areas that heretofore have been inaccessible to them uh, as they have conducted their recovery operations. But at this point, that person, the remains of that person do remain outstanding. We do not have, uh, we have 33 of the 34 victims recovered. Yeah, there's a question that's uh, relating to uh, uh, some details of uh, the investigation and interviews in the investigation, and I'm just not at liberty to discuss any of that right now. That's part of the ongoing investigation, and those are the types of questions that we, myself, nor anyone here is going to be able to answer for you today. Mark Quinn, the LA Times. Sheriff, you say all five were asleep, and TSB said yesterday, uh, in the afternoon, that three of them, during interviews, there's indication. Like, have you, can you guys ascertain whether they were all asleep or the question was, the NTSB uh, information indicated that three of the surviving uh, crew members indicated that they were asleep, and uh, I heard the same information that you did, but I don't have any ability to comment beyond that, other than what has already been uh, in the public domain and has been released. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The question was, do the regulations stipulate that there's a requirement for a roving watch and to be awake at the time? I, I cannot quote the regulations verbatim. I can tell you the certificate of inspection articulated that there was a roving watch required for that vessel. Right now, we won't know um, exactly uh, where to focus until we get the wreckage up. So salvage is the primary goal right now. And I can tell you that um, with the resources we have now and have been brought to bear by the ATF as a, an official responsible for any fire, cause and origin within their jurisdiction, uh, I couldn't ask for a better team and more resources than we have now uh, on the scene that will, um, again, spare no effort or expense when it comes to looking at how and where this fire started. The question was, there, there have been a lot of agencies that uh, are involved in this, including NTSB, the FBI, the Coast Guard, and obviously our uh, office and, and others. And uh, all I can say to you is that there are many different aspects to this tragedy. Uh, every agency that is uh, here involved in this through the Unified Command and through an independent uh, investigation such as the NTSB is all 
uh, are utilizing their expertise and their, um, uh, their, their responsibility and their charge to investigate certain aspects of the investigation. So there are uh, a host of different things that are being investigated by uh, a variety of agencies and there are other agencies who are here in support of those operations because they have expertise, whether it be in the recovery of evidence, the analysis of evidence, uh, or what have you. So uh, it's, it's uh, perfectly uh, uh, appropriate and natural that we would have a wide variety of, of federal, state, and local agencies involved in this investigation. Yeah, I can't give you, the, the question was how many of the family, how many of the victims do we have uh, familial DNA uh, samples to be able to compare the DNA that we have been able to extract from the uh, victims who are in our care at the moment. Um, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you up to date. I can tell you that as of uh, yesterday, we had 20 samples. Uh, we had a variety of samples that were en route to us uh, from various parts of uh, the country and indeed the world, uh, having been gathered uh, through the assistance, as I said earlier, through the FBI field offices. Uh, we don't uh, be believe, I don't believe we have all of the samples yet, but we have made contact with all the families and uh, those samples will be forthcoming. And once those samples get here and once we have them, uh, we have the capacity to make those identifications within a matter of hours. Okay, as the, the question was, Smoke, alar uh, smoke alarms were on board the vessel and what their locations are. As previ previously stated in the first um, press conference, there was one located on the port and one located on the starboard. So starboard is right and port is left of the birthing space. I, I can't speak to that. I, I don't. I, I, I can't speak to that. I, I don't have firsthand knowledge. I, I, sir, I can't speak to that. I don't have first-hand knowledge of it. Thank you for asking. If there were sprinklers on board the boat. Yes, the question was, uh, did we identify the 18... Name are the 18 people who have been positively ID'd so far through DNA, and why did we release nine and not the rest of the names, if, if, if that's sort of close to what the question was? Uh, the, the reason that we didn't release the other, or not releasing at this point, the other nine is because we have not been able to uh, make notifications to the next of kin that we have made those positive IDs. And uh, we don't want families to find that information out through a newspaper article or through a, a news broadcast. We want to be able to personally... Uh, explain to them what's happened and uh, what's going to continue to happen in the uh, in the uh, care of their of their loved one. Um, we will be releasing uh, periodically more of those names, and I am confident that we will uh, likely have additional names to release, uh, if not by the end of the day, certainly by tomorrow as well. So the question was, are we planning to release the names of the crew and has the, I'm sorry, what was the last part? The Truth Aquatics filed a federal lawsuit yesterday to um, limit, li limit liability. Does that affect the investigation? And then there was a question about a federal lawsuit that was filed uh, apparently by the company uh, in federal court yesterday. Um, well, let me take those uh, second and, and first in order. The, I don't have any information to you, uh, uh, for you uh, about the federal lawsuit. That's something you'd have to direct to towards other authorities uh, in the legal system. Uh, with respect to um, your first question, um, I think that, and I'm sorry, you said that. Are you releasing the name of the crew? 
Yeah, the crew members, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we will not be releasing the names of the crew members at this time. Uh, I, I can't speak for NTSB or for the other organizations that are involved. Yes, we'll put a we'll put a, a press uh, release out uh, subsequent to this press conference that'll have that information. The question was, what is the difficulty in contacting these family members? Um, as I indicated earlier, these family members are scattered across a wide area throughout the state, throughout the country, and in some cases throughout the world, and uh, typically. These are notifications that we do not like to make over a telephone call. These are, are in, this is information that we would like to, to address families face to face uh, and follow up with, uh, with questions. So that, that's really what's driving a lot of this at this point. You mean with respect to the families? Of identifying who they are? So the question was, is, the, is the, the boat company, was the question, are they working with us to identify the families? It's important to remember that this was a chartered trip. The chartering company was separate from the company that owns the vessel. So the, the company that booked the charter, um, we had some delays in getting information because the co-owner of that company was aboard the Conception and was lost uh, on the conception. She was one of the, the names that I just read to you a few moments earlier, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Kurtz. Uh, she had uh, documentation and information that was aboard the conception that was lost when it was lost. We were able to, through a secondary set of information that was in the custody of her husband, who was the uh, other co-owner and who was also a dive instructor, who was on a remote dive uh, in South America, uh, we were able uh, yesterday, I believe, to finally get the information from the booking uh, that, that had more detailed information about uh, dates of birth and uh, addresses and, and contact information in the event of emergency and so forth. It was information that we just didn't have at the very beginning of this uh, event. So the question is, have we conducted autopsies and how many and what was the cause of death? So um, we have made a determination that we are not going to conduct autopsies on these victims, traditional autopsies. We have done external examinations. Um, uh, we have done toxicology uh, uh, tests. We have done um, uh, a review of this entire process by our uh, pathologist, but our pathologist is uh, convinced, without having to conduct autopsies, that, uh, that these victims uh, were victims of um, smoke inhalation, and uh, that is going to uh, be at least part of the, uh, that's going to likely be the primary cause of death, but it's going to uh, uh, be followed up with uh, information and until a final determination is made through examination of toxicology and other means, we won't be uh, providing that information. Sure. Thank you. Yes, if you, again, if you guys can just please raise your hand, wait till you're called on, state your affiliation. That way we can control the flow of questions. Sorry, I was Uh, I'm going to defer that question to the Coast Guard. I don't have any information about that. I'm not sure that she will, she will either, but I'll let her answer that. Uh, the, I'm sorry, ma'am. The question was, there were two licensed captains on board the boat, and were they licensed to operate this particular type of vessel? Okay. Uh, there is a manning requirement on the certificate of inspection, but I, I, uh, I don't have that information in front of me, but we most certainly... Excuse me. We most certainly can can produce that for you. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear. I, I couldn't hear you. Sure. Certainly. So. 
uh, the question was, what other challenges have been posed uh, in addition to the winds? Uh, well, uh, with winds comes um, some pretty treacherous currents. So, uh, you know, the divers can only stay on station so long and battle the currents, and, you know, they, they would become fatigued very quickly and, and put them in a precarious situation that, that could, uh, you know, put them in an in a unsafe position so that the divers... But with the combination of the winds and the currents, the divers would have to actually exit the water until until we have a more stabilized um, na- natural environment. So the question is, uh, thank you, sir, for your question. The question is, is today the first day that we've been able to um, begin raising the vessel, and is it conceivable um, that it could be raised prior to the winds? Um, uh, today is the first day that we've that we've commenced actively uh, changing the aspect of the vessel. And what I mean by that, so the, if you recall, the vessel is upside down, and so we call that inverted. And, and so the first step is to gently roll over the vessel um, with uh, the appropriate rigging equipment and then have that stabilized prior to beginning the raise. And as I, as I indicated previously, it is just not a fast raise. It's going to be a very gentle raise um, to try and retain the vessel to, to be intact. Um, with that, you know, that... That, that could be a very lengthy, a very lengthy raise, and I, I, I have not seen the updated weather report, so I, I can't give you a definitive on, you know, if we could conceivably um, complete that prior to the onset of the weather, sir. Okay, so the question was, can you can I explain what the role of a night watchman is and a, a roving watch? Um, so with that, uh, specifically what the language was on the certificate of inspection, uh, I, I personally read uh, roving watch is required, but beyond that, what the stipulations are, I, I, I can't speak to that. But is there some general terms that you use that other vessels use that your own fleet uses? Uh, I, I can't speak to that, sir. I, I don't have that information. And then, Tom, I have a question. You talk, when you talk about a roving watchman, what is the role of that person? The role of that person is exactly that, is to rove and check um, the safety of the area that they've been um, uh, placed in charge of. So the question was, can I give a thumbnail of who's investigating what aspects, what, uh, you know, what's being investigated by, by what? And um, I, 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 I could give you one. I'm, I'm reluctant to do so because I'm inevitably not going to include everyone and, and uh, do so completely accurately. But just to give you an idea, uh, the Coast Guard obviously is, is here to investigate the uh, marine-related aspects of this accident. They were involved in the uh, initial rescue response. They were uh, are now in charge of the marine scene, as it were, protecting that area and overseeing the salvage operations and doing uh, a host of other things there as well. Uh, they also have uh, several other uh, team members and aspects that they investigate as well. Um, in this and uh, are, are part of this with respect to uh, more technical types of things. Um, the Sheriff's Office is investigating. Uh, this occurred within the, the jurisdiction of the, the County of Santa Barbara, and uh, our, our agency is responsible for conducting the death investigation. Um, I am, in addition to being the Sheriff, I am also the coroner for Santa Barbara County, and so we are conducting a coroner's investigation and we have uh, uh, responsibility in that area as well. 
Uh, the fire department, uh, as you heard before, is involved in determining cause and origin of this, but because it is a, uh, con there is concurrent jurisdiction here, um, we also have the resources, obviously, of the federal government here with the ATF National Response Team that has come, uh, as well as the, uh, the NTSB, which is responsible for investigating uh, accidents of, uh, of uh, of either aviation or marine or rail uh, uh, of, of a nature along those lines, um, and I'm sure I'm missing some others. But basically, those are the those are the areas of responsibility uh, that are there. And then there are a host of other investigative agencies that are in support of those uh, operations because they have expertise in in everything from underwater evidence recovery to uh, to the investigation of uh, fire. Uh, uh, after the fact, uh, and, and so forth. So what those, the FBI? The, the FBI is actually part of that. They have a their dive team is an evidence recovery team that is here as well. Are they doing, in the support role then? Or? They are in that in that role and and other roles of support to other federal agencies because they're investigative uh, in nature. And as I indicated, they have been in direct support of us in terms of this uh, attempt to get everybody. Uh, identified. Before I take the next question, I just wanted to clarify uh, something. I misspoke uh, about one of the, uh, the victims, Ms. Kurtz. Ms. Allie Kurtz was not the co-owner of the uh, booking company. She was the sixth crew member who was uh, on, on, on board the conception and was uh, in the, uh, asleep in the ca uh, passenger compartment at the time. So uh, the, the co-owner of the, the company was aboard the vessel, but we um, are not releasing her name publicly at this time, although it has been in the public, uh, the public domain here before. So I'm sorry, your question. Uh, Stephanie from the AP again, sorry. Um, why the decision not to do full autopsies and the fact that the, the, coroner, the medical examiners believe that they died of smoke inhalation, does that mean that they died before they, died before they were burned? So the question is, why no autopsies, and why? Um, uh, uh, because the, you believe the cause of death to be smoke inhalation. Yeah, and, and because of the, is that because of the cause of death is believed to be smoke inhalation? So the cause of death, the preliminary uh, indications are that the cause of death was smoke inhalation. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we will not have a final uh, uh, cause and manner of death until uh, all. Uh, aspects of uh, the coroner's investigation, including toxicology results, come back in. But the preliminary indicators are that all of the uh, victims have uh, exhibited signs that are indicative of, uh, of this. And in my personal discussions with the pathologist, they're, uh, you know, deferring to his expertise that there is, uh, that there's not going to be any additional evidence obtained in an autopsy that will um, that will confirm that, um, other than the fact that, uh, uh, you know, it will delay the process in terms of releasing uh, the remains to uh, to the family members. And this is something that we are, um, uh, you know, cognizant of, and again, trying to balance it. And I've had discussions with all of our uh, federal partners and uh, with our, our other people and with respect to the, this uh, indication about not doing autopsies on these victims and as long they're they're comfortable that as long as our pathologist it can render a decision and he's comfortable that he will be able to render a decision uh, without the autopsies that we're going to move forward without doing them at this point. So does this mean that they were dead before the flames basically overtook them? You're talking about burn damage. Yeah, the question was, does this mean that they were dead before the, uh, the burn damage on the bodies? And uh, I, preliminarily, I can tell you that the indications from the pathologist are just that, that uh, the belief is that the, the victims uh, died uh, and that the burn damage to the victims was post-mortem and not anti-mortem. In other words, it occurred after death and not before death. So when the crew tried to rescue them and the flames were already engulfing, they may have already been dead by that point, by the time the crew that that would be uh, that would be that would be the uh, indication. So, not not before. Well, no, you just tag, tagged on one last line that said before the crew realized that I, I can't speak to that. The it, the indicators are from the preliminary examination of the bodies that uh, the victims died prior to being burned. So that's that's what we can say with some certain preliminary, but but with 
a high degree of certainty at this point. So We're going to wrap things up at this point. Um, I do, for any of our Spanish uh, affiliates, I do have a Spanish-speaking uh, lieutenant that will be able to answer some questions and get you some of this information in Spanish. I will also stick around in case you have any additional follow-up questions about what was spoken to. Um, so again, thank you on behalf of the Unified Command for you coming to this press conference. I'll get out the names and spellings, um, everything that the sheriff uh, disclosed about the victims' names that we are releasing. I'll get that out on a press release uh, within the next hour or so. Um, and then as we are successful in uh, identifying and, and making next of kin notification, we'll release those additional names as we're successful in that process. Thank you again for coming, and, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. No further press conferences uh, are scheduled at this time. All right, you've been listening to the latest press conference at the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Headquarters in Santa Barbara as we uh, continue to learn more details now on the fifth day of the investigation and recovery operation for the Conception Dive Boat Fire. Search and rescue operations are continuing. They are still trying to recover the final victim, and we did learn the names of at least nine people officially that were on board from the sheriff, Bill Brown. He also said that preliminarily pathologists within their department say that it appears the victims may have died due to smoke inhalation prior to the flames actually overtaking the entire boat. We're going to have another recap of this coming up at 11 o'clock. We'll see you right back here in eight minutes. Until then, we return you back to regularly scheduled programming.